Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. All right, we're live. This is Graham Brown and Michael Waits from Asia Tech Podcast. Hey, Graham, how you doing? Very good. Thank you very much. We are live in Shanghai, China. Wow. Exactly. Wow. So where have we been in the last, like, seven days? Uh, let me recount. Fukuoka, Japan, Tokyo. Bangkok. China. All right. So you Bangkok, right? Fukuoka, Fukuoka, Tokyo, Tokyo, Shanghai. Shanghai. So here we are. And we are with Huawei today. We've got a lot to talk about. It's going to be a little bit different today. We're not doing this live stream on Periscope like we usually do. And uh, a number of reasons. One of the reasons is we're behind the Great Firewall. Yeah, so it's hard to get everything recorded and set up and broadcast live, right? So exactly. there are ways to get around, but we don't want to do that. We don't want to be those people. Yeah. So we want to, we're here with Huawei, which, uh, you know, uh, they've invited us kindly here, Walter. Jennings. Walter Jennings invited us. Yeah, really exactly. nice actually of him to do that. So we're here as his guest, and we're going to talk a little bit about. I guess you know the interesting thing about companies like Huawei, and especially large IT companies, Chinese IT companies. You know they have huge reach. You know what's the challenge for a company like that trying to get out to a bigger audience, right? Because they're not. You know these companies don't have these sort of ebullient leaders like. Steve Jobs at the forefront, right? Well, we, I mean, we talked about this yet, like yesterday and all day today, right? It's like yeah. if I asked you the story, even just the origin story of <laughs> Apple Computer, you know, yeah. Steve Jobs, Wozniak, sitting in the garage, doing all yeah. the stuff that they did, maybe the Homebrew Computer Club, but all these things, Microsoft, you know the story. Yeah. Right? HP, David yeah. Packard, like you know all these stories, but we don't know the origin. And it, it matters, right? Because when you go out to try to understand the humanity behind a company, exactly. understand the story behind a company, you really kind of want to know like how it developed into the behemoth and the, like the huge, powerful company that it is. And unless you really know how it started, you can't get a good sense, I think, for what it means today. Right. And that's the thing, isn't it? When you have these large companies, they become unwieldy. And that whole thing that, I mean, you know, in storytelling, they talk about these origin myths. <laughs> right. I mean, they're all myths to a certain extent, yeah. right? They become mythical, don't they? They sort of, the, the story do, transcends the fact, right? <laughs> it's like the Beatles, you know, when they met... <laughs> You know, hi, I'm John, I'm Paul. I'm the right. best. Right. <laughs> exactly, the one that didn't make it. But everybody knows that, right? Yeah. All right. And you can, you, as you rightly said, you can talk about it in the context of Microsoft or you can talk about it in the context of Apple, Amazon, whatever. But think about this. You can probably name me every CEO of Microsoft. Right. Okay. Every single one of them. Bill right? Gates, Steve Ballmer. S Steve Ballmer. And the other guy. Satya Nadella. Yeah. That's it. And you've known that your entire life, right. whether you wanted to know it or not. Yeah. Okay? There are actually currently three CEOs of Huawei. Right. And I'm not sure who they are. And that's not really a problem, but it just more, it's more humanizing, actually, yeah, to yeah, actually yeah. know who those people are. It's the story part. Because I suppose when you become a huge organization, you lose your humanity, right? And the, the origin story helps people reconnect with that. So how exactly did Huawei start? Well, here's the interesting thing. They do actually have a founding myth, right? They do. Right. <laughs> they do. And we just learned it from a couple of gentlemen who work for Huawei. Was it Scott who told us? Scott, yeah, yeah. Scott Jamar. John. Scott Jamar and John, right? John yeah, right. North, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's not widely talked about. And he, I think that's, that's a, it's like a hidden gem within any organization, isn't it? It's that they have this DNA, this founding story. And people don't, you know, they don't connect with it or they don't think it's important, right? Yeah, and, and, but I, I actually do, and we talked about it before, right? So how was the company started? Well, almost the same way that Nike was started. Right. Right, out of that guy's trunk. What's right, the so story of Nike? Well, Nike, Phil Knight was a runner at what, University of Oregon or Oregon State University, I can't remember. Right, and back then he didn't even have a logo. Right. You, do you remember <laughs> the story about the logo? He paid some student like, like 20 bucks. Or was something. it 12 bucks? <laughs> something like that. should have been a residual right. for every <laughs> sneaker, a penny. Oh, well. Would have been billions and billions of dollars. Yeah. Anyway, but so Huawei was actually founded the same way. The guy gets out of the army, looks around, and says, yep. what am I going to do? He says, I'm going to start selling modems to people. Who yeah. knows what the speed's on? My, fir my first modem was probably 56K, 28K, I can't remember. Right. Right. And then I had two 64K ISDN circuits. It tells you how long ago it was. Cause yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Michael's ancient. 97. <laughs> um but this guy started selling modems out of the trunk of his car. Right. right. But why is, why is that important? I mean, why is that important? Because people might say, well, you know, that's kind of like just a bit of history. We put that on the website. 
It's important because I think for a company that ends up being this size to sort of maintain that type of personal culture, the person who started it has to have struggled a little bit. And that struggle, I think, right. as a leader continues. You can't not get away from it. Right. It's humanizing, right? right? So, I mean, let's just pick somebody, right? So, Steve Jobs was a founder as well. Yeah. And he had a chip on his shoulder. Maybe it was because he was adopted. Maybe yep. it was because... He was an know, outsider. He was a complete outsider. Yeah. Maybe it was because he never graduated from college. Yeah. Right? I mean, he just audited courses. Yeah. We don't know, really, because we never spoke to the founder of Huawei. But what we do know is that there was struggle. And that struggle, I think, it's an, it's an overriding feature of any great corporate culture. Yeah. And the reason why is because that person, no matter how wealthy, you can measure it in money or power or whatever, but that, that power emanates exactly from that person's struggle. Yeah. And I think it's something that most people can identify with too, whether it's a tech company or a shoe company. Or any kind of Hollywood movie, right? Cause well, that's the story arc, right? Right. Right, that's the story arc. The hero starts off. He's kind of almost like an accidental hero, right? Yeah, I mean, do you think that when Phil Knight started his company or when the founder of Huawei started the company that they expected this to be no. a company that did $70 billion worth of revenue? Right. That was exactly. spending something like 14 or 13% of revenue on R&D? Yeah. Do you know what that translates to every year? A lot of money. Nine, ten billion dollars a year on research and development. Right. But this is the other thing that the rest of the world needs to know outside of China, right? So there have been some issues with Huawei as a company um, being able to get their technology into the U.S. market. And the reality is that from Huawei's perspective, at least in my mind, this is not their view. It's my view. So they can probably do without the U.S. market. Mm. The global market for the things that Huawei makes, let's be fair. Unlike a company like Apple, which is also a device company, but does not make the back-end technology, the switches and the super sophisticated gear that literally run the Internet in countries like China, in the rest of Asia, in most of Europe, okay, th this company is running the back-end. So they do make um, personal devices as well, right? They make phones, the P10. They make devices, right? The, the Mi8, all these things. They make great devices. But that's not where their, mm. the bulk of the revenue comes from, right? So they can do without the, the domestic market in the United States. They'd love to have it, for sure. And at some point, that'll change. But the thing is that not even the story of this company is out there. And I think that for us, coming here, right, Walter's desire to get us here is our ability to tell that story. Mm. What find doing, the story. Find the story, yeah. right? Dig it up. And what do you like, like, what do you think? What, what have we learned so far in the sort of day and a half that we've been here? We, you came in when? On Monday, right? right? Yeah, Monday so afternoon. So here's the thing. I think... Talking about that story, I see somewhere like Huawei, the challenge for them is that they have a story, but they have yet to realize that that is really important for them to connect and create influence, right? And let's take two, I mean, let's sort of step out of IT a little bit and take two example companies, right? I, I want to think about McDonald's and Starbucks because pretty much, they, you know, you take McDonald's and Starbucks as an example of storytelling, right? Now, McDonald's, A, nobody knows who the CEO of McDonald's is. Not today, but they knew when Ray Kroc was, right? right? exactly. That's part of the founding story. Correct. And you take Starbucks. Everybody knows Howard Schultz, right? And he wasn't the founder either. No. But again, I, he was the guy who took that vision and built exactly. it up. Exactly. He had that founding story, which was he like, did. you know, I went to Milan and I saw how the Italians, like, you know, treated their coffee with love and all that. And here's the interesting thing now. I mean, everybody talks about McDonald's as like, you know, being this, you know, it, it's kind of like the fast food it's the, you know, it's the embodiment of everything that's wrong with fast food, right? But, you know, you take any kind of, it's not the product itself, you know, because Starbucks food, you know, you take any one of those mochaccino, whatever. I and mean, sell them separately outside of the Starbucks infrastructure. Right. And then what happens to it? Well, you know, in the, it's like 1500 calories in one of those things. Right? No right? one's going to do that. <laughs> so here's the thing. I think that it's like, it's purely example of storytelling because Starbucks has told the right story and it's, it's, continue to tell that story. You go into the store and you see the whole thing about the Arabica beans and all that kind of thing. But McDonald's has lost its story and it's become this sort of faceless brand. It's just like, you know, McDonald's story is this stupid, like, curly-haired clown. Right? right, I mean, it's a right? clown. It is a clown. It's a clown. So what is the story there, right? I mean, and, you know, that's the challenge. It's like, you take a large IT company, what path do you tread? You tread the path where you spend billions on above-the-line advertising to get people's attention and influence, or do you spend all that money on building a culture around the story? But here's another really interesting question. So 
as an American, right, as a U.S. born person, I can tell you who founded Kentucky Fried Chicken. Right. Hewitt pa- no, but seriously, so Hewitt Packard. Dell Computer, as we used to say, it's in the name. Yeah. Um, so that one's pretty straightforward. Amazon. Amazon, right? Even eBay. Pierre yeah. Madar and his yeah. wife, right? Like we know the answers to all these things. So I would posit, I would posit the question: Is this a cultural thing, right? Although, but it can't be purely Asian, right? Because we knew who founded Sony. The Toyota yeah. family put their name on the company. Right, so Reng Fei did not put his name on this company. Right, huh? right, he didn't do it. So we know SoftBank, Masayoshi Son. Right, Masayoshi Son. We know all this stuff. So Alibaba, we, I mean, Alibaba. Chinese, right? I mean, Jack Ma. Right? Yeah, Jack Ma. So is it is it a a cultural thing? Maybe maybe um, Huawei was founded so early. Right? Yeah. this is a People Liberation Army former engineer yeah. who founded this company. Right, so m- maybe back then the culture was a little bit different than today. And clearly, right. Jack Ma is not a typical anything right right so i'm just curious if it's like an a- asian culture thing hmm. or if it's an old fashioned thing you know like we always say in the united states right is this um is this just because you know the depression era thinking type yeah, of thing yeah. is this because he was just born in the you know but th- there's a lot of companies who came out of that era i mean you know nokia is a g- good example right i mean it came out I mean, Nokia was around since the 19th century making rubber boots. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> and it had that founding story, which is all that sort of Finnish Sisu thing, which is this resilience that you could, you know, you could take a Nokia 3 series and throw it off like a 10-story building and it would yeah. still survive, right? Yeah. So that was the founding story. But so it's not kind of like a generational thing, I think. Maybe and not. It's, it's maybe not an Asian thing. It may be a combination of all those factors. But, you know, you take Jack Maher as an example. You know, he he was an English teacher. He speaks English, so he's kind of got that understanding of a communication and b what the outside world is like, right? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see a comparison in the revenue growth between behind a company like Alibaba and Huawei, and just right. see like how much they dominate their space. I saw a statistic today, actually, outside of China, but still relevant, like. The amount of retail sales that take place in Indonesia, right? So a country of 270 million people, not a small, not a small country, is like less than one percent, mm. which just means there's so much room for growth there. I presume, you know, China obviously there was never a large installed physical retail base, just because the innovation here happened in the online space first, right? Right. That's just the way the wealth distribution and the wealth growth happened. But I'd just be curious to know, in relative terms. Only because I'd just like to know the difference in culture between those two companies. One is the front end of the internet, right? Yeah. I mean, Tencent, of course, is there as well, but Alibaba is the most well known. Right? I think if you walk down the street in the United States and said, Have you heard of Alibaba? people would say yes. Yeah. But if you talked about Tencent, yeah. maybe not. No. I don't know. Outside of Asia? No. Outside of Asia, probably yeah. not, right? Um, but then again, no one would know who the founder of Huawei was. So that's not a problem if they no. just want to build the back end of the internet, right? Yeah, so here's the other question. Though, I right? mean, like, Cisco, as an example, did that. I mean, who, who are they? Yeah, I used to John Chambers, like, maybe. Yeah. yeah maybe. I don't remember, though. That, that's a guess. Right. And probably not a very good but guess. But only you knew that if you were on the internet, right? Yeah, fair enough. And I mean, I guess we knew who founded Intel because that guy was pretty famous, too. Yeah. But he um, was sort of yeah, he's part of that whole sort of Microsoft story as well, right? Yeah, the whole Intel thing just sort of grew out because of him and, and Bill Gates did that thing. But, but the question for us, right, being here is, What's the story today? Yeah. Right? Because this is the question that we asked, yeah. and we asked Scott that thing too, right? Like, what's the question? And I think Huawei's reached a point in its corporate sort of life, life um, cycle where they're really trying to figure out what their global story is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think if you'd looked at it even three or four years ago, I mean, most people that knew anything about it outside of China would have said that they were a handheld device company. Yeah. Right? Competing with Xiaomi, yeah. competing with Oppo competing with Apple, competing with Samsung. And yet none of those other companies make the back-end stuff. So it's like, how committed are they? We don't know, right? We're still trying to find out what that story is. But how committed are they? Like, which business is the real business? Mm. Right? And then what does it do going forward? This is really key to my understanding of what that story is. Is it classic IoT? If we can even say IoT, is it smart cities? Is it smart devices? What are they doing in the AR, VR space? We see things from HTC. Uh-huh. We see things from Sony, but we haven't heard any, that not that I've seen announcements from Huawei right. in sort of the virtual reality space. If you think that this is going to be sort of the next level operating system, or the next operating system for the next 10 or 15 years, that that's going to drive a ton of innovation and not just entertainment, right? not just gaming, 
But in everything that we touch, that whole augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, since they're running the whole back end, right. very sophisticated, non-trivial technology, what are they going to do on the front end as well? And is that why they got into the device business? Mm. We don't know, right? And what we do know for sure, though, is that companies like Apple, companies like Samsung, companies like um, that are producing Vibe, they're all going into the AR and VR space. Mm -hmm. So what do we think, like one of the biggest technology companies, one of the most um, sorry, sophisticated technology companies in the world is going to do? I mean, what do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, the front end must drive the back end, right? Because well, in the integrated it, businesses. So Apple used to take a lot of flack in the old days for mm -hmm. you, why you're running an integrated business. License the operating system. License this and mm -hmm. other thing. In reality, today, your integrated, your vertically integrated businesses, whether they're platforms like purely software, or hardware and software, the ones that are dominating. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at Google. It's not just a search engine, right? All this Google services, whether yeah. it's Sheets, Docs, yep. all that stuff. They make phones, they make Android, they do mm -hmm. all that stuff, and all of it feeds off each other, right? We talk a lot about the virtuous circle. So how does a company like Huawei build that virtuous circle? What's the story for the next 15 or 20 years? And I think that's what we're finding out, we're trying to find out when we're here. Right. So they could, I mean, you look at what Xiaomi's doing as an example, right? You know, they're trying to be that IoT company. Yeah, because they, they were building devices. So they came out with the phone. They yeah. had a crowdsourced way of sort of deciding what people wanted in the phone and for the manufacturer yeah. of that phone as well. And it had this sort of meteoric rise. And now it kind of fell off a little, a little bit. bit. Yeah. Right? And that, again, it could be because they don't run an integrated business. But like you said, they did try to build, you know, toasters, yeah. refrigerators. They still are branded. building all kinds of things, right? The me brand, right? Yeah, yeah. Even to like, you know, plug sockets, right? Yep, plug sockets, everything. Yeah, right, little robots and all that kind of stuff. The but question that's is hardware, the, right? Soup. Yeah, it's hardware. But and then maybe that's that's the challenge, right? But that level of hardware, to me, right? So the difference between Xiaomi and Apple, I mean, there are multiple differences. One of the differences is that Apple's built an entire ecosystem around their software and hardware. Mm -hmm. All right. So there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of developers that are out there developing software and third-party services for that, and that takes time. Yeah. You remember the super famous scene, right, of Steve Ballmer standing on stage, running back and the, forth, the sweating gorilla. like crazy, like yeah. a gorilla screaming, developers, developers, yeah, yeah, yeah. developers. And those partners really mattered. I mean, he was a bit insane, but that was part of his thing. But the reality is that building that ecosystem yeah. and having those partners support your business is what's going to keep people there and keep it sticky. Well, that's why I think it comes back to the founding story as well, that whole storytelling, because to get developers on board, they have to see the bigger picture. They have to see what the, the end game is. What, what is this all about? Right. And do they want to be part of that culture? Exactly. And it's easy. I mean, Apple was so easy because of that story, right? Oh, these guys are like us. There's two guys, you know, building these home kit computers. <laughs> right. They, and they were. Right. Have you ever seen an original Apple computer? Yeah, you see the photos, the guys. The know, wooden like things and the, yeah. yeah. So they're like us. They're one of us, right? And that's, that's always the problem, right? So that's the challenge, because if they want to build an ecosystem, they're going to have to win people over. Right. So the question is, when you move out of your home market, when you yeah. move out of China, first of all, and when you move out of Asia, how do you do that? Right. right. So and, and what do you focus on? Because pro sometimes the problem with a company that's really big, right, is that there is no focus. Right? And that's what, again, that's one of the things we're trying to figure out when we're here is, what is that focus? Mm. And what is that story? Yeah. Right. So if you looked at some of the demonstrations that we had today, they were, and this is not just our opinion. This is some of the chatter that we heard going around the um, the floor today. Is that this was also, this was a um, you saw some of the demos, and that the demos were really high level. Yeah. Right. So some people were telling us, yeah, one of the differences between this conference and some other conferences is not good or bad. Right. It's just a difference. Is that. If you go to some other sort of tech companies' conferences, you can actually look and touch and see Hands and on, feel right. the product, right? It, right? Yeah, yeah. So AR kit may not be perfect, but maybe uh, you can just watch somebody yeah. demo it for you, go into a room and see it later. Yeah. Or if you're at an IBM conference, right, you get to see some Watson demonstrations. Whether they're good or bad is indifferent, but you get to kind of get a visceral feeling for what right. they're like, right? So, and, and again, this conference goes on for two more days. Yeah. So this is just a first impression. But the question is, are people going to leave with this feeling of now I know, now I can go tell this story? Yeah. And, and think about it. How many international press are here? Yeah. Approximately 200 or more. Yeah. There are a lot of people here to tell this story. Right? And they're from all over the world. Do you remember last night when we went to um, the, the event? You want to talk the about pre -event that? pre-event event. Well, we we'll should talk about it a little bit. We should talk about it a little bit because we, when we went to get our badges, right, 
The badges were arranged by country. That's right. They were. Yeah. And there must have been 30 piles. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing, really. Just from all over the world, people are coming to cover this. And I think that's just going to keep happening more and more. Well, it shows you the reach of a a company like that. It has the resources to get people. Now, the question is, is can they convert that reach into relevance? Right. So what exactly? Yeah. That's where we're going with this, right? Right. That's exactly right. So how do they how do they do that? How do they convince people? Because there's a there's a theme going around right now, and that is, you know, the next five years, there are going to be products, physical products, coming out of China that are so popular that people are going to wait in line for them. Like yeah. They used to wait in line for the iPhone. So the question is, who's going to make those products? Yeah. Right. And I'm not talking about just the back end. See, the back end thing is really powerful, right? You own that. Maybe that's the beginning of the building of the vertical business because a smart city is going to have to run yeah. on that back end, right? It's going to have to run on that software. That software is going to have to be non-trivial. It's going to have to be up 99.999% of the time. And it's going to have to continue to develop really quickly as well. Mm-hmm. But that's just for smart cities. There's IoT. What's going to yeah. happen? We talked about this almost a year ago now, autonomous vehicles. All of the tech things are going to happen. If the bottom of the stack is weak, if that foundation is not strong, the top of it's just going to be really weak. It's going to topple over. So how are they going to build on top of that to get to where they want to be? So right? t- let's, uh, let's ask the question, who has actually done this before? Whether it's in tech or in telco or IT, who has been in that position and so- sold a really good to- story, told a really good story even, you know, such that they can go global? Because in, inside of China, cool, everybody knows – Huawei, right? Everybody. But outside, here's the challenge. Because when you've got a smart cities, you know, you're now competing with everybody, right? Who's done that? I mean, Apple? Mm. Maybe, though. So Apple has this weird... Apple's like the BMW or the Porsche of the tech world. Right. They ma- you, can, you can argue that they make the greatest products. You can argue that they make the most sophisticated products. But you can also argue that their market share is still really low, even though their profit share is really high. Right. right? So before Porsche was taken over by Volkswagen... They were the most profitable car company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was and the same in handsets. Apple was like 9% of the revenue, and 60% of the, 62% more. of the profit. Yeah, something really yeah. high, right? Yeah. So they've done okay there. But I think, you know, these big tech companies, particularly platform companies, kind of end up being like the Roman Empire. They get really big, really strong. That and doesn't then, end well. No, it doesn't end well, but it hasn't ended well for anybody. I mean, look at Hewlett Packard. They owned everything and now they're nothing. Right. right? What was their problem? Just exp- I mean, what was their focus? Yeah. Right? So when you were a kid, you knew what Hewlett Packard Printers. stood for. <laughs> Printers. But I mean, even before well, that. Same as Kodak. We talk- calculators, Kodak, machinery, Xerox, right? all these things, right? Yeah. And they, they, what they did, well, Kodak is, a, I mean, you shouldn't even have brought that up because we can talk for hours about Kodak. Kodak invented digital photography. Yeah. But what did they do? With it? They were too afraid of ruining a legacy business. They could business. have been a mobile company, right? They could have, could have been everything. Space, right? the, first, the first digital camera I saw was a Kodak digital camera. But the people that invented that internally couldn't get the support of their manager. The key is, in any of these big companies, is what's your iPod? Yeah. And what are you going to do to destroy it before somebody else comes in and destroys it? Right. Again, okay, that's just the most recent example. Right? I mean, IBM had this problem with the mainframes. They went out and watched Microsoft and Intel go out and build an ecosystem using having them help, right? They license the operating system, and they just they turned micros. I mean, one of IBM's biggest um, computers into a commodity. Yeah, IBM compatibles, right? Once that was okay, Compaq came out. Then HP started building stuff. Then Dell destroyed them, and everybody came out and destroyed them. Barbarians of the game. But that's exactly yeah. what it is, right? So the question is, how long can you sustain your ability to innovate? And your, avil- and your ability to protect whatever moat you've built around that innovation. It's but a good do, question. Do they, no one's been able to do it for an extended Are these big companies able to innovate? Because I think here's the challenge is that the way they innovate is by staying small, right? And the innovation comes from these small teams. I mean, even like, was it the MacBook team had 150 people? We've got this 150 people thing, right? You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of research about why 150 people is the optimum size of any team, right? So the MacBook team, 150. The Roman legions had 150. All, you know, but any large organization, department, thousands, right? So how do you... So there's a couple of things going on here with Huawei. First is innovation. And it, maybe it comes from the outside. And they have to be the guys that build an ecosystem, foster an ecosystem. And, you know, create that platform for innovative startups, you know, small developers to 
build innovation for Huawei. Yeah, I mean, look, this is a real. There's no real straightforward answer to this, no. right? Can a large company innovate? You see companies trying to do it in the fintech space, right? So they go out and they try to either buy and integrate these small fintech um, sort of startups into them. It's just really hard. Yeah. And one of the hardest things is that there are legacy systems inside every company. And the people that support those systems and the people that short-term profit off of those systems and have a P&L off of those systems never want them to go away. Mm. And what ends up happening, and actually Netflix is a really good example of this, what ends up happening is those teams, as good as they are and as smart as they are, they don't know how to manage the next thing. So go back and look at the management of Netflix. They literally threw away like 90% of the team that ran their DVD mail business. Mm -hmm. Once they decided they were going to go into streaming business, because think about it, one is just completely analog. How do I get this box through the mail into a mall or into somebody's thing in that red envelope? It's still movies. It's still entertainment. But then that, the knowledge that's necessary to do that could not be more different than the knowledge to build li um, streaming technology. Mm. Right? And they waited. You listen to, who is it, Reed Hastings talk about yep. uh, the founding and sort of the growth of Netflix. And one of the things that they said was they always knew they were going to do streaming. And when they started doing it, right, they split off the former DVD company into a separate company. And they took, I mean, there's no other way to say it. They took so much flack for it. But they knew where they were going, and they didn't care about short-term revenue. I mean, they cared, but they knew where the long-term revenue was going to be, right? And they innovated really quickly, but the only way for them to innovate was to lop off the old part of that company. And most companies don't have the culture to do that. So that's, to what extent is innovation, um, that storytelling, you know, like bedfellows, so to what extent are they reliant on each other that you've got to have? To have innovation, you have to have this storytelling. Well, again, the whole idea, so one of the things we never talked, we haven't spoken about yet in the context of this story is, you know, one of the stories about Apple was, we just want to make great products. Yeah. Right? We just, they were hippy-dippy people, right? Mm -hmm. You go back and look at them, long hair, big beards. I mean, they were the, not even the original hipsters, right? Yep. But their idea was, we don't care about profits. We just want to make the greatest products. We're just super focused, yeah. laser focused on products, right? So if the Apple Macintosh destroyed the Lisa and the Apple II, so be it. I don't care. I just want to build a great product. And they, they languished for years. Uh -huh. But for two reasons. One is because they were shit at supply management. I mean, supply chain management. But two, um, <clears throat> because they couldn't build great products. And they had a legacy business inside the Macintosh business that wouldn't let them update their operating systems. And the rest of the world just moved on. And it literally took the founder to leave and come back and to bring back all of the next stuff that he built from next. Yeah. Next. Right, all the Objective C, all the software that was built there was actually <laughs> sort of built into OS X and then innovated upon. But the question is, right, can you do that stuff internally? And what does the company's culture mean for that? So the question, again, for us is to find out internally at Huawei, what is that culture of innovation wow. like? Because that's going to drive it, too. But does, doesn't that go back to well, it does though, right? so for a the guy, guy selling the modems? Sure, because right. look at Nike. Nike has right. been the most the strongest like biggest i don't know athletic wear company mm -hmm. it's just never stopped getting bigger they innovated not only in the shoe space in the wear space in the golf space in the tech. talent space yeah. in the tech space in the marketing space mm -hmm. they innovated in everything that they touched and again it's because phil knight was just one of these guys who was like i don't care but masayoshi son same way we haven't spent a lot of time talking about him over, the, over time, right? SoftBank, but, yeah. But SoftBank. But, I mean, that dude never cared about current profits. Never. And he doesn't care about money personally either. All the dude wants to do is build big things. He said that from the day he founded the company. And we, I'm sure we've been through this before. Yeah. You listen to his co-founder, Mio Chiken. He'll sit there and tell you. We, Masayoshi Son stood up on a box like the day he founded his first company making these tiny little devices and said, I want this to be a $100 billion company. And like six out of the ten people that were in the room left. Yeah. So you're right. The whole overriding culture and their ability to innovate is highly dependent on what that founding sort of culture yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. There's, to so much extent, all of what the company does as a result comes out of that. It's like a DNA, right? It's DNA of the organization. And if, and if the company does something which is it goes against what that DNA and that culture is, then... It could work short term, but in the long term, like with Apple, it falls off, right? It creates resistance. It doesn't work. They become, they water down their DNA 
people don't get it. It doesn't fit in the box properly. And things become difficult for them, whether that's innovation or marketing or influence yeah, and, or whatever. And look, it's, it's a difficult um, lesson for management to learn. I mean, John Scully, right, who was the guy who actually got rid of Steve Jobs mm. and was originally hired by Steve Jobs, right? The guy used to be at Pepsi. Couldn't get anything done, not because he was a bad manager. He turned Pepsi at, during the, at the time into a juggernaut, yeah? It's because the, his culture for managing, his culture for understanding innovation was very different. Yeah. Then they brought in Gil Emilio. Didn't work. The only thing that worked was bringing back the founder. Yeah. And there are, there are some intricacies there that we're not talking about, but it's always easier when the company itself sort of maintains that embedded culture. Yeah. As long as that culture contains the ability to innovate, right? Now, we know that Huawei is an innovative company. You can see what they've done. You cannot grow from, you know, a former army engineer mm. selling modems out of the trunk of your car into a company with, you know, tens of billion dollars of revenue without innovating. Now, the one thing we didn't talk about yet was, you know, there will be people out there who think, and I say think, right, because maybe it was true at one point, that some of these really large Chinese technology companies are just copying things that other people have done in the past. And I would make the case that depending on um, your country, and I think countries tend to be kind of arbitrary things anyway based on rivers and mountains, but I think your country's um, stage of development economic development is heavily correlated with your necessity to copy other people's technology at any level of your development. But once you reach sort of parity or close to parity, what happens is you start innovating and forking and doing things that you never thought possible before. And I think Huawei has actually reached that point. You can make the case that America was built on the innovations of the UK, Mm -hmm. right? If you look at the things that were invented, the steam engine, the automobile, all those things. like who's, you, People know about Henry Ford, but they don't know who really invented the car. Right? You don't know who invented... Like, people don't talk about this. But America itself was actually built on the innovations of people that weren't in the United States. It's I mean, a problem, for God's right? sakes, Carnegie was yeah. Irish, right? Yeah. Or Scottish. I can't remember. Scottish, Scottish. Scottish, right? But even the Japanese then took that... You know, when the Japanese large, right? automotive manufacturers decided that they want to reinvent themselves after the war, they sent a delegation to Detroit. Sure, as you would have done. And just observed and copied, right? Yeah, they just went home and then they innovated on supply management, right? All that kind of stuff. They had the suppliers near their factories, right? The Toyota way. All this stuff. Well, that came from an American guy, Deming, right? Who went to to Japan. Nobody would listen. That whole Kaizen thing, which you talk about this constant evolution, it came from an American. It came wherever. It didn't matter, right? Right. But it did. And they could have used it. All that kind of stuff could have been used. But again, the auto companies in the United States had the same problem that you know, all large organizations have. Yeah. This is the way we do it. This is the ratio of humans to whatever that we have to get done. And then when another person says, hey, look, we're going to build our suppliers in the same t- t- town right around us. We're going to ins- give them incentives to be as efficient as humanly possible. We're going to do on-time ordering from them so they only make a product and deliver a product for us if we have an order for it to make a full automobile. That whole concept, right, of on-time manufacturing was talked about way before the Japanese did it. And interestingly enough, the Americans went back and then tried to study it later to try to figure out where it came from and then realized it came from them or it came from somebody in their midst. But again, once you build it, it's hard because you have legacy systems. If your supplier is not within four miles yeah, yeah. of your business or some such thing, it's hard to do that on-time um, manufacturing. That's just one example of it, right? Sony was the same way. They didn't invest the transistor. It took them until the 70s to invest something like the Sony Trinitron. Yeah. But things move more quickly today, Right. And you can moan about the fact that Chinese companies copied U.S. or European companies, or you can just get used to the fact that they're going to start out innovating you, yeah. and Huawei is going to do that if That's they haven't is, already right. started doing it. I mean, the, you know, look at the music industry. Any famous artist is a some form, uh, you know, hand-me-down from the person that came before them, right? Nobody was an original, right? Everybody just took a bit, improved on it, and it's the same with what we're doing now in technology, right? To say that somebody was a pure maverick, I mean, you know, they, nobody started from zero, right? No, and, and nobody succeeds alone either. Exactly. And if Standing and, on the shoulders of giants, right? Well, but, even, but even Steve Jobs did say, what was it? Um, all great artists steal or yeah. something. I can't remember what the exact quote was, but something like that, right? Exactly. But again, once you steal that and you make it your own, yeah. you fork it, then you start innovating. Yeah. And I think Huawei's reached the point, actually, and not today, but prior. It's coming. Yeah. It's definitely coming. Yeah. And then they're going to do things that people won't expect. 
right in their home market. So I was talking to somebody inside the company today, and obviously they're going to have their own view, right? And that view is going to be slightly skewed towards goodness rather than badness. But I said to them, look, they run the entire internet, the back end, the pipes in China and in Eastern Europe. And they waited for me to say, and Europe and South America yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the rest of Asia. Uh-huh. They just waited because they just looked at me like, you haven't even talked about half the story. So I think what people are going to find out is that that innovative culture that was built from the get-go is still happening today, right? So, again, getting back to this, it's like we want to find out over the next two days what is the overriding story for the future. Yeah, exactly. It's a challenge, isn't it? Because I think sort of going back to where we started is that sometimes if you work within the organization, you, you A, you are unaware of that story and its importance. You may know what the story is, but you're unaware that that's... That is how the meaning of the organization is translated to people on the outside, right? Because everything on the inside is known. It's all common knowledge. It's, it's like, you know, it's fact. We know this stuff, but outside we don't. So that's kind of what needs to... That's where the work comes in because, you know, and I see these people who work in communications in Huawei and I think they're at a great position because they really need to drive that. You know, they need to... You talk about this sort of... We're at this arc now with a company like Huawei where they're, they're now having to get into this different type of innovation where they're not just copying what other people are doing they're now going to be at the head and driving things forward how do you then do that and this is where i think communications plays a huge role not just necessarily in getting the message out there but connecting with people real influences about getting the story out there because you i suppose the parallel take a company like samsung you know samsung's been hugely successful purely by without even portraying that story to anybody, right? I mean, nobody knows who the CEO of Samsung is. Same thing. Any non-Korean. Same thing. So, you know, but Samsung is is not a guaranteed, right? You know, they're... they're No, and they had big problems, right? So, But Samsung as well doesn't have... They're not vertically integrated in the same way, right? They do make a ton of different products, not so focused. They do like a thousand different things. But remember two years ago when they came out with, was it the the Galaxy S7, was it? And caught on fire. Yeah, the eight, eight, yeah, seven. You're right. Right. So, is it possible to build a company like that without a story? Because Samsung has shown that it, up to a point, it's possible. Well, where are we with that? Do they need that story to make it go? Glo- I mean, they are global. You know, they're one of the biggest advertisers in the world. They sponsor every single sports event headline. So, everything. So, Samsung, from a market. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, from a market share perspective, was the largest seller of phones and smartphones in the world. Right. Now they made everything from flip phones, candy bar phones, all the way up to sort of, you know, glass and aluminum phones. But Samsung was in a unique position that Huawei is not in today, and that is that Samsung was also the supplier for all of Apple's, right? For a lot of the parts that went into Apple's products, so they knew what the designs were before those designs were actually announced. Yeah. It wasn't too hard for them to go out and pretty much copy them wholesale. So why can't well, they do that? They, they, they could do that, but, but remember, Samsung actually had access to all of Apple's designs prior because they were the ones doing some of the manufacturing and supplying some yeah. of the parts, right? So whether it was the chips or the shaping, all that stuff, they saw what some of these things were going to look like. It wasn't hard for them to copy. And they also had the tailwinds of Android behind them, right? Yeah. And they were the first people to figure this out, right? As opposed to moving to Symbian, which a lot of people did back in the day because Nokia was still really powerful. Um, we forget what BlackBerry was like back in 2007. BlackBerry's biggest profits were actually probably in 2009 or 2010. And they fell off a cliff in 11 and 12. Yeah. Okay, so Samsung was in a slightly different place. And back then, Huawei wasn't ready to do that. But again, now they've reached the point where they're going to innovate. And the real question is, now that they've built a PR structure and a, and a communication structure, it's now time for them to actually go out and start doing this. And I think Connect, which is what in what we're participating this time, is actually one of the ways to do that. And now the question is, if there are 20,000 people at Huawei Connect this year, there were only 15,000 people, I say only, yeah. kind of tongue-in-cheek, last year, right? The question is, again, how does that message get out? Right, and what is the message that people are actually going to get from that? 
Are you taking pictures? Yeah. <laughs> Just you as Mike was talking, I'm ready to take a selfie. You kind of have with to my new s- With my new Huawei phone. Yeah, it's your new Huawei phone. It's a great idea. Oh, yeah. And remember, I think, I think Huawei exists in a different world than um, Samsung used to exist, right? So the question really is, are they going to build that completely integrated business? Or are they just going to focus on their back-end really sophisticated devices? And when we talk to people here, um, I think you know, someone actually said to us today that the phone business and the device business was like an add-on business. Yeah. I think it has to be more than that, actually. Well, it, may, it may be an add-on in, in, in terms of profitability, but in terms, in terms of, of revenue, it is for sure. But again, the like value, brand, value, brand value matters. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it's the same with Amazon, right? You know, are books the most profitable aspect of Amazon? Probably no not. No way. Exactly. But without books, it'd probably be nothing, right? Yeah, but it's again, it's, it's almost like I like, to use the, I like to use Wimbledon as an example of this, uh-huh. right? You go and you ask anybody, even I bet like people that w- have been watching the Wimbledon tennis tournament on TV, where is it held every year? Oh, it's at the Wimbledon Tennis yeah. Club. It's got to be. It's right down the street from the Wimbledon like pub in the Wimbledon hamburger shop. But that's not where it is. But what they've done over time is build that brand. Yeah. I mean, even the Academy Awards, it's, people just call them the Oscars, right? But it's that branding actually ends up being really important. Yeah. See, the thing is, a company that's this size and this scale can actually get real benefit from people knowing what Huawei is, what it stands for, how it was founded, and all that stuff. Because then they don't even have to, at that point, once it becomes a part of everybody's embedded thought process, right, when it comes to technology or devices or even the back end, they don't have to even advertise. They don't even have to have the PR necessarily because people are just like, oh, Huawei, that's a, it's a great company. They make great products. Yeah. Oh, they run the whole thing. Like, that's easy, right? P- like, no one talks about Cisco anymore, but Cisco still probably does 75 to 80% of the back end in the United States. Maybe Nortel does some, but if that company even exists. But you know what I mean? Mm. They don't have to talk about it anymore, but when they go out to sell the product to the big enterprises that use it, they just buy whatever the new thing is, mm. Right. And Oracle's kind of done the same thing. You have some more, and IBM did this in the old days, and AT and T in the United States did this. You know, there was that commercial. No one ever got fired for buying AT and T, right? And this is when they started getting competition. But Huawei's going to reach that point, right, where the brand itself gains so much from the device business that that back end business, which is where most of the profit comes from, is just going to run itself and sell itself. I think. Yeah, for sure. Hey, switching gears a little bit here. Sure. Shanghai. What are your thoughts? Shanghai. Shanghai. We've got a, I mean, we've got an amazing view from the hotel. I'll post some of that on LinkedIn. On our Twitter feed as well, Asia Tech Pod. Have a look at the view from the hotel. Pretty stunning, right? I mean, that has changed a lot in the last 10 years, 15 years. There's nothing there. So here's, here's what I think. My, my, last, my first time in China was in 1991. My last time in China was 1992. So the Shanghai that I visited in 1992 doesn't exist anymore. I mean, it does, but it's surrounded by things that couldn't have even have been conceived back then. Right? So Pudong, which is where the airport was, yeah. which is where all those like, big shiny buildings are, I, it, unless my memory serves me incorrectly, it just seemed like a wheat field or you know, just like a bunch of weeds. And huts. I remember looking across the river. I don't even remember seeing huts. I just remember seeing like weeds, yeah. nice yellow reeds. It was beautiful. But again, you know, I was young, so I, my memory could be bad. Um, but I think what really strikes me is that I was trying to put this into the proper context actually yesterday. The airport was super orderly, but not in a way that was like, um, you know, militaristic. It was just like everyone just waited in line and everything happened the way it should. There was no bumping, pushing. There was nothing wrong with it. I got into a taxi to come back to my hotel. The speed limit on the highway was 80. And I didn't, there was one wise guy. There was always one wise guy, right? He was speeding and weaving in and out of traffic, but one guy, even my taxi driver, I don't think he went over like 80 kilometers an hour and he wasn't switching lanes like a maniac. And I just felt like this is the way a highway should be. Yeah. I, like, I like order. Yeah. There's plenty of that here. But at the same time, there's a lot of chaos, right? <laughs> you could drive down the street. Yeah, People are walking down the street the other I way. I didn't see it. And maybe just because I live in Bangkok and just the contrast right. is there. Right? So... And I don't. I haven't been driving here, so I ride a scooter in Bangkok. So maybe the contrast well, is a good vibe, too strong for me. I like it. I mean, the vibe good, is energy, awesome. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Again, I mean, one of the reasons why I love being in Asia, right? And we we talked about yeah. this a month yeah. or so ago. Is that it's so young, right? So I don't feel like, and even the executives, whether they, and they are wearing suits and ties for Huawei, right? But even the executives just feel like they feel like young forty-five to fifty-five year olds. They don't feel like old men. 
Here's something really interesting about that. We talked about this before. Going off a bit of a tangent, but let's let's tell me, let's tell me. throw it out there. There's a, you know, there's been a lot of research and a lot of data published about billionaires in China, etc. And, and here's the interesting fact: there's there's more female billionaires in China than there is in America, right? But what, is that true? Yeah, the, that's the data, right? I mean, we have to dig. Th- somebody can tweet us if this is not true, but that's what I believe. But here's the interesting thing: speaking to uh, one of the communications people at Huawei yesterday. So Huawei has a board of 17 people. Oh, right. I remember. Right? Go ahead. Of which... How many? Four, four are, female. are female. Now, obviously, that's... Well, it's only a quarter, right? But compared to your average American or European board, I think they outweigh significantly here, right? I mean, that's yeah, a lot for an I mean, IT I would, say Euro- I would say Europe is probably more progressive. But with the or interesting Northern thing, Europe, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Fair enough. But for an IT company... I know, and, and think about it, and, and it's not brand new, right? So this is the, one of the excuses that people make when they talk about female executives in, in high positions, right? When they talk about the glass ceiling, is they'll say, well, you know, not enough of the women in that generation went yeah. to the right college or yeah. studied the right thing and all this other noise. Not right? enough but supply, right? Whatever. Yeah. But the reality is that, and we don't know this because we haven't spoken to the executives on the board that aren't women yeah we don't know if they've made a conscious effort or if they've just chosen the best people and frankly either way is fine but the reality is that those statistics those numbers don't lie you make a really good point yeah right and the person that told us that last night actually was quite proud of it as well yeah right and it's really good progress that's another story right well that actually is a great story that's a story that needs to be told which well, is not the, being told no that's another thing too so if i i bet if i went to this is a th- and this is the tell, right? I bet if you go up to a person who isn't in China and says, "Okay, who runs the internet in China?" It's like, you know, Tencent yeah. or Alibaba, but no one's going to know the back end yet. They will soon, but they don't. And then if I said to them, "Okay, if there are seventeen people on the board, how many of those board members are women?" They'd be like, zero. Hmm. One maybe as a token, but it's not like that." Yeah, right. It's four. And actually, I don't think that you said let's. Uh, Let's go a little bit off piece, right, and talk about something different. I don't think that's so different. Yeah, it's still I a think story, that's right? actually it's still a story. I think it's really important, actually. Yeah. I think what we've discovered, we've discovered some uncut gems, right? We've got some uncut gems. We've got to, we've got to refine them a little bit and tell the story. I think that's where we are with this, right? Because maybe, maybe, you know, maybe we're wrong, but I think it's, it's something there that we need to get out. And maybe because we're outside as we see it. Yeah, and look, we're here for another day and a half, yeah. right? So there's more to learn, and I'm sure this will not be the last time we'll be talking about this company or companies like this, yeah. right? It's Graham Brown and Michael Waits, Asia Tech Podcast. Where can people find out more about us? Obviously, Twitter at Asia Tech Pod, Facebook.com slash Asia Tech Podcast, Asia Tech Podcast.com. Anything else? We're everywhere. We are everywhere. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Graham. Thank you, Michael. This is Graham and Michael in Shanghai. Next week, we are going to be... We don't know where we're going to be exactly next week. We're going to save that as a surprise because there's a lot up in the air at the moment on our tour. Lots of things coming up. We're heading to Vietnam, Myanmar, Jakarta, Jakarta, Indonesia, Bangkok, Singapore. Singapore. Yeah. So... And we may go to Hong Kong as well. Yeah. We haven't counted it out yet. We want to do as many countries as we can. So... We'll see you there. Thanks, You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.